Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 156 for Monday, March 5th, 2018. Thanks, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors for this episode include TuneLicensing.com, where coupon code GIGGAB2018, that's GIGGAB2018, will save you 15% off of licensing fees. We'll talk more about that in a minute here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Los Gatos, California, it's Paul Kent. How you doing, Mr. Kent? I'm doing pretty good, Mr. Hamilton. How's life for you? Life is good. Life's crazy as always, but uh, but good. You know, it's always it's always. You're heading out to the big South by Southwest show pretty soon, huh? I am. Yeah, I'm going to be there for both uh, the interactive portion of it, which is sort of the beginning of the week next week, and then the music portion, which uh, sort of wraps up the week the the last five days or four days or whatever it is. So yeah, it's been about four years since I've been, maybe three. And, and how many times have you gone? Um, well, I officially I've gone, it's maybe five times, I guess, but you know, I used to live in Austin and it's a weird thing because when you live in Austin, the vibe is avoid South by Southwest, like the plague, because it, you know, it, it takes over all of downtown Austin. There's, you know, tons more people there than there ever were. They shut down streets. It's, you know, it becomes a disaster in terms of traffic and everything. <laughs> well, and if you're used to a city operating one way, then for a week, it uh, it completely, you know, jams up and operates this different way. So you just naturally, you kind of avoid that. But uh, so I, I would occasionally go to like a showcase here or this there, but I never really attended South by Southwest when I lived there. And then I just happened to be down there. That's the city where we started all our businesses. So I'm, I always have business back there. And I was there. Uh, I think we were opening a new office or something. And so I was there for, and it just happened to be that week of South by Southwest. And they gave me a press pass for that week. And I thought, well, I, I should go to some of this. And then it was like, oh man, like how did I miss this while I was here? I should have just gotten a hotel downtown. <laughs> and like, that's what, that's really, if if you're, no matter what, no matter how far away you live, unless you live right downtown, uh, that's the right way to attend South by Southwest is like get a hotel in downtown. And but that's, you can't just get a hotel, right? The number of hotel rooms versus the number of people is a little out of whack, right? It is way out of whack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right. So perhaps easier said than done or you just have to plan ahead. Um, but yeah, when I, I think I probably booked these six months ago and even at that point, hotels were limited and they they're one of those like a lot of conferences do they only let you book uh hotel rooms after you have purchased yeah. a ticket so you're not just locking up a, a room for right, right, right. yep yep so but purely on a music level what's the what's the most magical interaction you've had seeing music at south by oh man y you know it's hard to, that's a good question Man, I'm not prepped for that. Um, You've seen some like pretty big names in some pretty small venues, right? Oh, totally. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I mean, I, I guess the um, when I was going regularly, it was when REM was in the process of sort of wrapping up their career. Uh, they played a, a a quote unquote big gig at South by Southwest at one of the larger venues, but it only holds two thousand people. It's an outdoor place called Stubbs. They played like a midnight set there for like two hours and it was great. There, it, like mm -hmm. that was, it was the best REM show I've ever seen um, because it was, it, it was small for them and it was energetic and there were a lot, it seemed like they just kept pointing to people in the crowd. It was clear that they were amongst friends. It felt like you were watching them in a hometown crowd, even though, you know, technically it wasn't. Um, so that was a good show. And then by the way, we don't talk enough about REM on this show. No, nope. I would just like to say that. Yeah, it's true. And then, uh, you know, and then I guess internally they had agreed to their breakup, but they had yet to announce it. This was, you know, a year or two later. And I went to a tiny little club to see a band called The Baseball Project, which is a band that Steve Wynn put together with um, Scott McCoy, who is the guitar player sort of the the one of the 
few ancillary musicians that REM would would tour with. Um, and uh, Peter Buck, who's the guitar player in REM, was the bass player in the Baseball Project. And then Steve Wynn's wife, whose name I can't remember, is their drummer. And so I went to see this thing because it was like, okay, well, there's this REM tie in and they they do songs about baseball. And so that's cool. And I was in this tiny little club. I think it was even one of these makeshift clubs. They'll like take extra space that exists somewhere in downtown Austin and turn it into a club just for, you know, five nights or something so that they can have more venues. And I'm watching the band and thinking, oh, this is, you know, this is pretty good. And I turned to the guy to my left and said to him, hey, this band's pretty good. And he said back to me, he's like, yeah, they're great. I've seen them a couple of times. Of course, I realized as soon as I started talking to him that it was Mike Mills from <laughs> from R.E.M. And <laughs> and so uh, a few songs later, they uh, said from the stage and we'd like to bring our good friend, Mr. Mike Mills, up to sing a song or two. So he, he went up, he sang a couple of songs. And then when he was finished, he came back down. Now, there were only I mean, if there were 50 people in this room, uh, wow. like I wasn't counting all of them. I mean, it felt like there were about 20 of us. It was really sparsely attended. And so he came off stage and, you know, stood right back where he was before, which was right next to me. And so I turned to him and I said, uh, hey, man, you're pretty good, too. <laughs> and he laughed and he <laughs> said, thanks. <laughs> it, the weird part about that particular night was that Stipe, Michael Stipe was also in that club. He was he, he wasn't standing right next to me, um, although there's another night at South by Southwest when he was similar thing, when I just tapped the guy in front of me like, hey, what's the name of this band? And he turned around and told me and it was like, oh, you're Michael Stipe. OK, gotcha. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, yeah. You know, short, bald guy. I didn't know and, until he opened his mouth and it was like, oh, right. That's got a cool two random interactions with with uh, different members of one of your favorite bands. That's yeah. actually there's yeah. a little serendipity karma flying around there. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. And well, that's what those things are good for. Right. That, I mean, you totally know, certainly from our back world days, you know, there were like all of a sudden, you know, there was cheap trick walking around the show floor or, or Aerosmith or, you know, Sinbad or, you yep. know, a lot of the people. And that's kind of like one of the fun things about that. I imagine South by is probably pretty great for that because it's, you know, it's a music festival. Comic con is probably like that. Macworld was like that, you know, because it was a open to the public consumer show. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of really cool celebrity sightings and, you know, over the years, I mean, you know, James Brown played some of the early parties right. of Macworld, right. you know, to see, you know, a hero in a, in a, in an environment that small and intimate is always really kind of fun. It's cool. Well, what it is, is you realize, yes, this particular person that you're speaking with is, you know, perhaps one of your heroes, but you have a mutual hero in common and they are the person on stage. So it's it's interesting running into someone in that sort of uh, environment, like you said, where you're almost I mean, it, in a sense, you're equal, right? You're there just watch. You're both there watching someone else. And, and yep. so that's kind of and, and the same was true with, with Macworld Expo, right? We're all there because we're fans of Apple. And it just so happens to turn out that, hey, you know, you're you're Rick Nielsen from Cheap Trick. But like we're we're both here to drool over whatever new thing Apple just just released. Yeah. So well, that's especially cool. the jobs keynotes were right. kind of star studded affairs. Totally. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It, of, it used to be a lot of fun. Well, that's that's right. cool. I, I peed next to Al Gore. Uh, very at, nice. At a, that's uh, something to remember. Yeah. After an Apple keynote or something. It was, it was an yeah. environmentally sound pee. You know, it's what's interesting non, about that. Non fleshless. I hadn't related these two stories, but I peed next to Al Gore after a, you know, we were all in line. It was, it was right after an event downtown San Francisco or something. It wasn't related to Macworld, but it was one of these Apple, you know, summon the press and, and have an, a, an announcement. And so I did. I peed next to Al Gore. It was fine. It was no like I just looked down like who is shiny. Sh oh, OK. Got it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, and then at South by Southwest a few years ago, um, the Foo Fighters did they did two movies, I guess. No, they, they released one movie. It was that that um, it, it really it was Dave Grohl that that did it, it was that movie Sound City. And if you yeah. haven't seen cool Sound movie. City, right, go see it. It's so cool. Um, but so I went to the the screening of, of that at South by Southwest. And then it was actually quite nice because right after that, they played um, 
I guess the Foos played right after that. And then there was a Sound City show. It was, there was a lot of Foo Fighters happening. Um, and I might be merging two years of South by Southwest together. Because I, I think there was there was the Sound City thing. And, but there was also a year where there were the, the Foo Fighters released a movie about like their album or something. I don't know. Anyway, uh, Dave Grohl was there at the theater because it was the premiere of the movie. And he did some Q&A or whatever. And, and after the thing. Uh, again, I went to pee because it was like, well, I have to leave this building and walk halfway across town to go to something else. And uh, sure enough, there in the bathroom, uh, Dave Grohl came in while I was peeing. And it's like security like, tried to escort me out. It, it was weird. And and uh, and Grohl said, dude, like to his security guard or whatever, he said, dude, he's fine. He's just peeing. It's OK. <laughs> so Dave Grohl's security is tighter than uh, Al Gore's uh, president or former vice president, Al Gore. You know, so there you go. That's pretty funny. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I hadn't, I hadn't All really right. So we've covered things. bathroom security in detail now. So we can kind of move back <laughs> on to our regularly scheduled show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there you go. But yeah, it like those kinds of things are, are cool. And it, it it's interesting because I've been prepping to, you know, to go. I kind of I build a loose schedule for the music portion of it. And I, I let serendipity take over. Like I wouldn't have made it to that baseball project show if I wasn't in line for like passes for something else. And some guy and I started talking and he said, you know about the baseball project, right? And I said, no, I have no idea who, who that is. And he told me who they were. I'm like, oh, cool. I'm open at that time slot. I should go, right? So I, I build my, my schedule um, based on what I know and then just kind of let it be, let that be, you know, sort of a guide, but not anything hard and fast. I mean, there's some sure. things where I want to say, like, yes, I want to go see that. But, uh, but at this point in time... South by Southwest, it starts in less than a week. They have not announced any of like the brand name headliners, um, which they do, which is sort of typical. They they just wait till the last minute um, to announce those. It doesn't really matter because, you know, you, you're just going to be right there anyway and you either get in or you don't. But mm. um, so I've been going through all the press releases. There's like 2000 bands that are going to play. So I'm not going to research every single one of them. Um, but I, I do look through all the press releases cause I'm on the press list and, and I look through all those and it, it's in what I've, I've noticed something, you know, as I have to read through, you know, a hundred press releases every couple of days when I bother to like, go take a look. And there's so many of these, it started me thinking about promoting your own band and the right way to get people's attention and then the way to not get people's attention. And yep. it's really interesting, you know, like I'll, I'll read these press releases and it's like, hi, you know, we're a band from, you know, Rockford, Illinois, and we'd really like you to come to our showcase. It's like, yep, next. And and the things that really attract, I mean, cer certainly pictures are more interesting than not pictures, right? Because because we're visual people, right? So a picture that that is captivating is better than the last four emails, which had just blank text. But even just a picture, like I'm not going to go see a band just because I like the picture. Uh, a description, like reviews of or quotes from reviews of either your performances or your songs like and they can be things that you use to describe your songs they don't need to be somebody else's reviews but when i read something and it says the performances are captivating or this guitar player is sizzling or something like that in the first lines of whatever i'm exposed to that's what makes me go put that land band on my list and I started thinking, right? I mean, because it's like, oh, this sound, this is exciting. Like somebody said, and I, I mean, I might not put it on my list right away, but it'll make me want to read a little more like, oh, okay. Or maybe I'll listen to the little snippet that they sent and like, okay, yeah, I'd like to go see this band or whatever. But um, I, I, I feel like there's a lesson in here for, you know, even if you're, you're like most of these bands, of course, are all original bands. Uh, so they're trying to attract you with something other than, a name of a song that you'll recognize because you won't. Right. right. So, but even still, like even being a cover band, like a, a club owner that doesn't know you from Moses, you have, you know, if you list all your songs, like, okay, well, everybody and their brother plays American Girl. So that, even that isn't attractive, even though it's familiar, 
it's not necessarily the thing that's going to make somebody say, yay, I can hire another band that plays American Girl. That's awesome. Right. Mm -hmm. Like there needs to be something to distinguish you. And you well, know, distinguish like, is the word, right? So, that's it. so yeah, I, I think I've shared this thought before, but so many bands that I see uh, when they market themselves, they always say they're the premier this or that. And I, that to me is always but like, put I, it away. I, I, no. I don't care. Yeah. The premier band. I from don't Rockford, care. Illinois. Another one. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Uh, you know, the premier rock, premier R and B premier this, that, that you're not, you're right. just not right. Yep. You know, you, anyone who self appoints themselves to premier this or that, but it's interesting that these, that these words and these lines are kind of captivating your interest because you're a jaded old media guy. And so, totally, you know, if you're saying. And I know so that saying, I have to ignore. I mean, if there's if there's 2000 bands, I'm I probably you'll see 25 bands. Right. So I have to ignore 99 percent of the bands that are there. Right? Just by yeah. definition, I, like I, I don't have enough time to, you know, I can see five bands a day, maybe. So, um. Yeah. When I'm marketing the house rockers and pitching the house rockers, I, what I, what I've been doing lately that seems to be getting some attention is I talk about, you know, we're a big band, big horn section, and it's a very different sound. If you want a different sound and different is the word that I've been using a lot to try and just have someone pause. Cause again, you're not going to sell your band off of an email or a press release or anything. You know, the, the sale doesn't get closed. The, you know, the best you can hope is a moment of retention. And that combined with several other things going on might help someone make a decision, whether it's an actual ticket purchase, money transacting, or a time purchase that someone's going to invest their time to come see you. I mean, it's really, you know, one, one piece of marketing is probably not going to do that. Right. What, what I'm hearing you saying is that if someone says, you know, every performance is captivating or you've got to see this guitar player, you've stopped for a second and a now this second. is in your mind. That's it. Yeah. And that's all like, that's, that's what you need to do is just get someone to stop for a second because I'm, I'm right. there going through just like everybody is. I'm going through, you know, a hundred emails. It's like, I I've got my flow, like to dismiss your email, my fingers literally already on that button, you, you know, cause yep. it was there a second or a half second before your email came up. Cause I deleted the last one. <laughs> yep. you know? yeah. yeah. And actually this is, you know, to, diverge a little bit. This is where social media gets kind of interesting because, you know, social media is so smart now. They can take data when you're scrolling through something and you pause at something for a few, you know, say, you know so this is why yep. advertisers are so freaking smart right now. Now, we don't have that ability, right? We don't have, you know, that sophistication. So, you know, our ability to write and say something that pops and, and makes us different. And, and I, you know, this is something, a mantra that we've had many times. It's like, how can you very quickly communicate a difference, a unique proposition? Are you a big band? Are you a little band? Is you have a, you know, singer, do you, you know, did they, and, you know, to the defense of what you said, if someone's had a hit song, that hit song is the thing that makes them different right now. And totally. so leading with that, there's this guy, Jack Tempin. He was a, a co-writer for uh, the Eagles. Yeah. And, uh, you know, his claim to fame is that he was a co-writer of Peaceful Easy Feeling, right? And many other songs by the, email, by the Eagles, too. Fair but, enough. But, but that, he, well, when he comes to town, he doesn't have a huge reputation as a performer. He doesn't have a huge reputation as a great band. He has, you know, what he has that will catch your mind, that will you know, stop you and give you a moment of recognition is co-author of Peaceful Easy Feeling, yeah. right? Yeah. And so the, and, and maybe what we're saying here is in your written communications, understand the goal. It's pretty hard to close the sale in any single written email or press release or, you know, anything like that. Right. Pretty hard. Right. What can what can you accomplish? And that is a moment of pause and a moment of recognition. You, you know, always like smart to add a call to action, you know. Check out the band, you know, so if a band caught you because, you know, every performance is captivating or you got to see the guitar player, you know, a call to action that says, see, you know, see what we're all about here. Then, you know, if you go to YouTube or if you go to somewhere else, maybe you get a like out of the deal. You, know, you find some way to kind of advance the ball and and, sure. and get the relationship to another step, which is. But again, I think the big thing is this is why the premier, you know, rock and roll band in the Bay Area Th that's not going to happen. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, to me that that's, that's, that's amateurish marketing, you know, a, a 
aggrandizing yourself, you know, th- that you're the best. If, how can you be the best? I've never heard of you. So, you know, right. just because you say it, I'm not impressed with your, your chest beating. No, right? we, we humans uh, find opinions like third party opinions far more captivating than we do, you know, your, your self description. So if there's any way you can even lead me to believe that the words I'm reading might have been said by someone else, right? Like that's going to be the thing that, that, uh, that come, that, that, that sticks with me. So when I read something that says you, you, you got to see this guitar player, like, I don't know who wrote that, but it sure sounds like something that someone not in the band would write. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Not you got to see well, our a third party player. endorsement, something, something that says somebody else besides you yeah. is you know willing to endorse this. And but give even their if opinion. you don't have a third party endorsement, just writing your, your yeah. lead, like you, like yeah. that's what it is. Like, that's, you know, that's going to get someone's attention and it gets yeah, you I that agree. you got to deliver as we always say, Right. Once you once you get someone's attention, especially once you get the booking, you mean, you know, you only get your press release or your copy or your email or whatever it is only gets you in the in any given door once if you're lucky. Right. So you've got to it's up to you to 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 prove that you're there for a good reason. So and, you know, I'll actually take this to another another place because. So you're reading press releases and you're, uh, you know, going through your inbox, right? Or, or press releases in your yeah, inbox. That's right. So it it seems to me like more and more and more video is the most important method of communication in social media, right? So even if it's you holding a guitar, you and your band standing around saying, hey, we're so-and-so, you know, come check us out. And, you know, they get three seconds of, of you guys harmonizing or, or you know, something sure. that gets your attention. Video is incredibly important. I'm sitting here, uh, you know, the band Steel Panther, right? I do. Yeah. So I'm, I'm right now looking at a sponsored post. They're coming to play, you know, about a thousand person, 800 person room in San Francisco. And it's two of the guys from Steel Panther just saying, Hey, Dude, you know us. You love us. Let's do this, right? Right. Video is incredibly important, and you can you can communicate so much more. Humor. Written humor is hard, right? Yes. If you're not good at it, you really look like a jerk. And so, you know, be careful about trying to use sarcasm or humor in your writing if you're not good at it. Yeah. Don't you, assume you're good at it either. You better get you, some feedback as to whether people are getting what you're what you're putting out there, right? And you never you have know a better what, chance. what mood someone's in when they're reading an email. Like when when you're delivering something humorous in a video, you can show that you are laughing or or comedy that, is hard. Is, that it is funny or should be funny. Whereas with writing, yeah, especially if somebody doesn't know that it's supposed to be funny, if they're not expecting humor, they may not get it at all. Yeah. Yep. Yep. But video, you hear what I'm saying? Video, especially as because, you know, they're so smart again with Facebook is like as you scan the default setting of Facebook is to autoplay a video. Right. Yeah. You know, you don't even have to click anymore and it's kind of in your face. And so video and getting good at video and, you know, it's it's. And I will be the first to wave my hand. I don't use it a lot because I'm way too self-conscious that I'm doing it well enough. Huh. But but you should. I mean, yeah. if you have a phone, you can create video and get it on Facebook in a second. In so, a second, you know, the tools right. are pretty easy. So yeah. literally, if you want to if you want to really be modern about uh, your self-promotion, video would be video being good at video, actually just being just getting your video up there will get you ahead of many of the groups that you're competing against yep. for attention. Yep. And, uh, you know, and we could, we could probably do a whole show about what would make for a good video or how to use video. But totally. I'm just, I'm simply saying it's interesting to me that you're reflecting on press releases. Press releases are, are, you know, that that's largely, you know, getting to be a dinosaur of well, the promotional. I, you know, everybody likes to say that email is dead. <sighs> that is such crap. Email is still so powerful. It is the thing people pay attention to. And it doesn't matter the age, right? I mean, like, well, it does. If you're younger than about 17, you probably don't pay attention to email at all. But after that, everybody's using email mailing lists still do amazingly well for your band. Like if you have a mailing list of a thousand people and you have 10,000 people following you on Facebook, you're going to get more traction out of sending that Mm. mailing list to a thousand. I think than you will posting a video to 10,000 people that aren't going to see it on Facebook. So uh, yeah, I, I, um, I, especially like if you're going to try and get in touch with a new club owner, 
like you're not just going to hope that they see your video on Facebook. You you might message them on Facebook. You might email them. You might text them, whatever their particular um, open avenues are. But it, it's going to be personal, like like direct. All right. Well, well, let me try this. Right. right? Yeah. You're scanning your inbox. Yep. And you're just doing, you're just scanning your news feed and Facebook. What's more likely to get, to get something, a video that auto plays and shows up in Facebook. I'm assuming you didn't turn off autoplay. I turned off. What's auto more play. likely. Yeah, <laughs> All right. The average person, no, not yeah. you. Yeah. Right. 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 So, right. so scanning your inbox, um, local band is playing, or, you know, here or, uh, you know, something visual in your news feed. So get, so you, you, you made the comment that a thousand emails directly emailed to versus 10,000 followers on Facebook. I'm going to flip it around to you. A sponsored post that auto plays in a news feed on Facebook versus uh, a mass emailing, which, which is more likely to, to get you to get to um, me some kind of e email. Definitely. Yeah. Because when I'm yeah. on Facebook, I'm not in the mode of like, I'm just killing time. Right. Whereas if I'm going through my inbox, I am being intentional about that. And I, I don't think I'm I, I'm certainly, you know, not everybody is that way. But I would I would say the majority of people are just like scroll through Facebook just to kill time. It, mm. it Because we do it because we don't know how to be bored anymore. Right. Well, that's true. So but I, I think when you're going through your inbox, you're paying attention to those things. You're del you're not like actively deleting each post that you see on Facebook and don't care about. You're just like letting them go. So I think you're in that mode of sort of being you're more numb when you're reading Facebook than you are when you're reading email. Not to say mm. that we're not numb when we're reading email. We are. But I, I think email's way more valuable than a, a post on Facebook. Um, now, the, you know, the, the question is, does your email make it past someone's spam filter and all of that? Like you should be using a service like MailChimp or something so that you're not stuck that way. If you try to send out email with, you know, like the old school way of BCCing people or whatever, like that generally doesn't work as well anymore. But um, but, you know, if you're if you're doing it right and you're using somebody that knows how to get and hit the inbox, then I, I think, yeah, I, I, I think so. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, yeah. I don't know. What you know do you what? It's, it's, here's the yeah. thing. Oh, that's the thing. Test. You right. Know, you do it. Right. You test. Yeah, that's exactly. what marketing is. A, B. A, B. It's the only way we know it, because otherwise you have no idea what works. Even then when you that's A, true. B, you don't really know. But yeah. 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 Hey, Paul, let's take a minute here and let's talk about our sponsor for this episode, which is Tune Licensing at TuneLicensing.com. This is a company that takes all the headache out of making sure that not only you get the rights the right way for any cover songs that you want to release, like on CD or, you know, in any way to your audience, but they also make sure that like artists are being paid the right way and they do it like they love the legal stuff. Because, well, it's crazy, right? Because we don't. Correct. Well, actually, I do. But most people don't. But they, we, when I talked with them, it was like, oh, like you people are like me. You're, you, there's something wrong with you because you really like all this legal stuff. But that's who that's who you want doing this. When I talked to them, they were telling me they wouldn't tell me which artist because it was like, it was, you know, we all like stories about dirt. Right. But they said like, there's one artist in particular that's covered all the time and they will not give you uh, the rights. But the law says that it doesn't matter whether they give you the rights or not. They have to like they, they're forced because they've released the song. Other people are allowed to l release it. But the way it works, the way the law works is that a notice of intention has to be sent and received. And they do that. And they yeah. do that. So like, right. But they'll take like sometimes they'll say, whoa, wait, don't release your song, you know, don't release your CD or whatever it is. Don't release that yet because we got to make sure they've received the notice of intention before you do. Otherwise, it doesn't work like there's, you know, the way the law is. It's like there's a lot of things that need to be dotted and crossed and circled and, you know, drawings and arrows on the back of each one. They do all that stuff. They yeah, it's your cover band legal buddy. That's it. Your cover band legal buddy. So check it out. Go to tunelicensing.com and enter GigGab2018. That's GigGab2018. GigGab2018 during checkout. And you get 15% off of their licensing fees for you. So Very cool. Yeah. Check it out. Tunelicensing.com. Our thanks to Tune Licensing. And remember, GigGab, G-I-G-G-A-B 2018 for 15% off. 
you know, I'm I'm getting ready for a, another madhouse, and uh, it, it's I I realized this morning, like I'm about to get our set list, and uh, and so I started thinking, okay, well, I got to be pretty careful about this because I'm going to be away, like. It's going to be two weeks, basically, between when I get the set list and when I have to go do the show, and I'm going to be away for a week in the middle. So mm-hmm. I've got to really be uh, on, on the ball. Like, when that set list comes in, I need to go through my process. And as I was th- realizing that, I thought, you know, this is kind of like, it, it, for Madhouse, what happens is we get a full list of songs, and none of them are the same. Even if the band is exactly the same musicians, which it often is. We're playing an entirely new show every time, but we're not getting sheet music. At best, we get lyrics with chords associated with them, like, you know, lead sheets or whatever you download from, you know, ultimateguitar.com or whatever. Yeah. And and so I realized this is like, it's not all that different from going in and subbing with a band or uh, even, you know, it's kind of like subbing in your own band for me because I know all the musicians, but these songs are brand new to everyone, not just me. Right. And, Mm -hmm. and the whole show hinges on the music starting and stopping where the performers expect it. So it, the lead singers know the songs way better than the band that's backing them up (laughs) because each, each lead singer only does between one and three songs. Whereas as the band, we're doing 25 songs in the night. And, yep. uh, you know, and it's important because we'll have like they'll cut verses out to keep things compressed and short and to keep the story moving along or whatever. But um, but it's, you know, like we and we need to know that, OK, after the last verse, they've got eight measures of whatever's happening. And then that's where the ending really should be. So it's this thing of reading through those those charts and playing the songs and figuring out, OK, what groove here, what tempo, how do we start these things, how many bars, you know, after the last chorus until it ends or does it fade out? And I need to ask that question at the one rehearsal that we get, uh, which often isn't even a full rehearsal. And uh, and and so it really is this exercise in intense preparation. And then I like I'll go through once and chart all this stuff out, either with questions or answers. Right. But everything has to be in there. And then I just start playing the songs over and over and over. And mm. it's it's the it's the playlist that I listen to for maybe not a week, but certainly many, many days in a row so that yep. I can I know these songs because it there's no way to write. It's it, it's not like I'm getting full sheet music for all these tunes where it doesn't matter. I could just play them cold if I have sheet music and they'd be mostly OK. This is like, no, it, it, like you got to know the song. You're just you have a chart that's going to show you where you are in the song. But you yeah. got to know how, like yeah. the feel of the song coming in. So it's really kind of an interesting thing. And I, I think it's probably helped me immensely you know, for uh, any other band that, that I'm in where I need to learn stuff because I like it, but it's, it's, it's a process. Right. And so it's taking those lead sheets and marking them up and, and putting like, I have my own little shorthand where I'll draw lines to show when I stop playing and when I start playing, but it's all based around the lyrics because that's what pop music mostly is. Sure. Right. You know, and so it's just way easier. It's like, okay, here's the chords for the guys that need the chords. Generally, I don't uh, because I generally play the drums. I've only played guitar like once, but um, you know, otherwise it's, that's just how it goes. And it's pretty, it's, it's, it, that's what makes it fun is, you know. Yeah. So I can relate to this in a couple of ways. So yeah. I've been doing these PK and friends gigs, right? So, right. Right. you know, I did them. The same thing. I did, uh, I did the petty thing and the petty thing was a little bit more right to the recordings, the studio recordings of things. And the only question then was how to end songs. Right. You know, sure. but, but a but, musician um, coming in that didn't know the studio recordings is in the same boat that I would be for Matt. You got it. Yeah. Right? You got to hit the woodshed. And, and actually yeah. I, I'm doing uh, one in the beginning of April. I'm doing a PK and friends, classic rock night. I picked a set list of classic rock songs. I picked the guys I want to play with. And I said, here are the songs, show up ready to play. No rehearsal. You know, they're kind of rock and roll fake book types of things. Right. Mostly, not all of them. But, you know, this is actually, um, from a band leader perspective, I pick guys who are good listeners because there's going to be mistakes. And the question is, how do you get out of mistake? And so, one, you don't want guys telegraphing the mistakes. So that would be the wrong type of personality 
to do one of these types of things. Two, you know, again, this isn't rocket science and I'm not picking songs. I'm not picking Rush songs. I'm not picking, you know, songs with crazy forms and that type of stuff. And often, you know, if the singer stops singing, doesn't it dawn on you to just vamp on where you are until the singer, you know, comes in? So you, you need guys with kind of a good intuitive yeah, sense, you, you big need ears. Intuition. It's true. Totally right. true. Yep. You, you don't quite have that because you do have a singer who's, you know, who's performing something. And that's, you know, you have a little bit different that there is some expectations to form. Although I guess it's similar. Oh, no. If, if that singer. singer up. Oh, yeah. You got to find them. Yeah. 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 And that that part's actually been interesting because as a band, usually, and I've got to find a guitar player for this upcoming gig. I think I found the right one for, for the next Madhouse. Um, but as a band, we generally have musicians that check all those boxes. And when we don't, it's awful. Um, mm. But, you know, a even lot, if they're a great player, it doesn't. Yeah. In fact, I, you know, we've had musicians that are stellar, stellar players, great readers in the theater world, which is how, you know, like a lot of this gets fed because it's it's sort of all pulled from the theater world. But being able to read and and, you know, nail a Broadway show is not the same skill set as showing up and having prepped your chord charts the right way so that you know what's going on. Like I said before, we don't have, you know, sheet music to read cold. You need to come in very warm on these things, right? Like you need to know yeah. your sounds. You need to know the groove of the tune. If the guitar drives it, you need that. What's interesting, and and it's worked out really well over the last year, is training these singers to be more like rock singers, Right. We in not in terms of the way they sing, they can all sing really well, but in terms of the way they interact with the band, it's like, no, no, no. Like, don't pretend the band's not here. In fact, just the opposite. Pretend the band is here and you're our lead singer. And so eye contact is important. Cueing us with big stops or whatever. Like the more you give us, the more we can give you because mm -hmm. you know this song better than we ever will, because you've rehearsed only this song and we haven't rehearsed 25 songs. So, right. yep. Yep. It's, it's, it's fun. Yeah, you know, and they and all these singers have really come around on it. Anytime there's a new one, I always take them aside and say, "Okay. Well, it's fun if everybody agrees as to what the what the common denominators totally. are and what the common goal and and you know yeah. what the what the it's great if you can have an intuitive process. I mean, I've played with musicians who literally cannot get out of their own way. The well, no, but that's the form. That's, that's how the song goes. Oh, yeah. And like it had, right. And they have to be yeah. directly to what they learned. And, you know, it really throws them, they put in the time to learn something a certain way. And, you know, this is not what I'm, what I'm describing is not like improv improvisational jazz where, you know, there's an A section and a B section and an open section. And then, you know, watch the leader, you know, no, to come back in. It should follow the form, but it might not because. And, and what do you do if it might not? Right. right? You know, that's, that's a question. And there's a certain to me as a leader, there's a certain common sense, I think, that kicks in as to what you do. Like I said, vamp in place. Uh, don't assume anything nope. because, you know, if you have five guys in a band and they all five are assuming different things, that's the <laughs> essence of a train wreck. Right. And that's what happens if everybody if you don't get the right type of guy, you know, uh, if a, if a if a singer needs a moment to gather himself and remember a word to go into another verse, stay right where you are Just and listen for what the spring. Yeah. Listen to what the singer is going to do yep. and then go, then go with it. Right. Yep. And, uh, but, the, and this goes to everything. This well, is kind of that essence of being an intuitive musician, because this is how you feel if the singer is, is driving some energy into a certain area and that might, you know, affect the, how you hit your drum or how you hit your guitar. Absolutely. I mean, this is, this is, this is what makes it from not being a jukebox, right? This is, this is, you know, about right. if your art is cover music. There's a live band instead of playing a track, right? Right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so yes, embrace that. And, and to your point, you know, I think of that as big eyes, big ears, you yeah. got to focus more it, like you need to know your part well enough that you can focus on what everyone else is doing so that go. it pulls together. And, you know, like during the last Madhouse, I remember we were doing we did this like all rocker 90s chick, like angsty version of Phil Collins in the air tonight. <laughs> it, oh, it was killer. I mean, it was really great. And it gave me, like I said, you know, I, I got to play that fill, right? That, uh, yeah. Th yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 
And cool. uh, but it was it was not that like it was it had that ethereal start, but it wasn't that sparse ethereal start. It was like this, you know, distorted guitar. And it I noticed as we were like in the show that our guitar player wasn't building it up enough. So I had, I turned to him I'm like, dude, this isn't the same as the Phil Collins version. He's like, Oh, it's not. I'm like, no, hit your distortion pedal and go. You know? <laughs> He's like, Oh, okay. 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 And he did like, he totally got it, but you need to like, everybody needs to be aware of what everybody else is doing so that you can kind of keep the thing going and just help. Uh, so this brings up a really interesting question. So I'm going to riff off that Phil Collins song. Yeah. In the world today of playing classic rock covers, is there really choose one or the other that might make you more successful? Is it better to play things note for note or is it better to impose your your creativity on on a on a well-known song? Huh. Man, okay, we've been around. There have been covers for years. You know, bands are out there playing covers. I, I know out here there's tons of classic rock bands. You know, it, do you get points still for sounding like the record, which is what cover bands used to do, right? That, that right. used to be that used to be how you evaluated it. Oh, they were great. They sounded just like the record. In today's day and age, these songs are another 10 or 20 years older than when many of us started playing them. Do you do you would you rather have a reputation of being a great cover band? They sound like the record. Or would you rather have a reputation of they and and can you be successful um, taking well-known songs and putting some twists on them? And the degree of the twists probably depends on your style and what kind of band you are. Right. But what would you rather be right here and right now? Me, I would rather be the former, right? Where it's it, you'd rather it, sound like the record. No, no, sorry, rather be the latter. That where I would, ah. I, I'd rather like take a twist on it, but not like if you're re like. There's one thing. There's a there's so there's a continuum here, right? There's the sound exactly like the record, and then there's sing the same lyrics, but the song really doesn't sound anything like the record. Like there's there's very little familiarity there. I like I. I don't want to be quite that far down the scale. I, yeah, I don't think you'd be successful being that far down the scale. No. I think if you lose the, if you lose the essence of the original song and it's no longer, you know, then yeah. I think you've got, you have gone too far, but you know, keys changed. Sometimes tempos changed. Sometimes, you know, a, a feel changed here and there. I, I don't know. I was thinking while you were talking, I don't know that I play any songs close to the record. I change most keys. Right. But you keep the melody. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, uh, you say yes, but we've seen people totally butcher melodies like, yeah. you know, take a Beatles song and sing a different melody. It's like, that that's always like a bad choice, man. Like, really? But um but yeah, well, but except for in, except for again, I'm, I'm being difficult here. Yeah. Except for the most standard of standards, you know, mm -hmm. like like you can do almost anything in pitch to yesterday, and people will know it's yesterday, right? Yeah, but it'll sound like crap if you. Well, well if you I'm just using it as an example, it. right? Yeah. If you riff too much, so, so so there are good choices and bad choices within there, but you could use the you could use the general melody of of yesterday. Yep. Uh, and do a lot of things to it. And and you probably can get points for creativity because it's such a ubiquitous song. You don't need totally. to try and, right? Yep. But a lot of Beatles is actually that way. A lot of Beatles is so ingrained in people. Totally. And as long, yeah, as long as you keep the melody, I think you can take a lot of chances with other things and and possibly have them be successful. And And that's sort of where... You know, I feel like I need to clarify on that continuum because there's a spot in the middle between sounding exactly like the record and sounding, you know, so far from it that no one recognizes the song. In the middle, there's that lazy slush in the middle, right, where you're <laughs> not like you're not intentionally doing either. You're just I, I learned I saw the chords on the Internet. I think I remember them. I'm just going to fake my way through it. Like that is the, to me, the worst choice. You, you, you need to 
Whatever you're going to do, I think be thoughtful, you, you be need purposeful, to be in, purposeful, intentional about, OK, we are going to do this part differently or we're going to do the whole song differently. And yeah, maybe we're not the world's best musicians, because guess what? It's impossible for all of us to be the world's best musicians. I'm not, you know, like there's only a few of those. So we're going to do it our way. We're going to play it within our you know, structure and our limitations. But we're going to be intentional about how we're going to do it. And we're all going to be on the same page with how we're going to do it. And, you know, to have one song a night where the band, you know, sort of flubs the ending or whatever, and everybody laughs about it. That's cool. And that's fun. Even for the crowd amongst 25 other songs where you nailed it. Right. right. But if you've got it's, 20, it's all 25, right, yeah. if you've got 24 <laughs> where it's the, it, no one knows the ending and only one where everybody nails it. That's not, not quite as night. entertaining. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I feel I like you've got to be careful when you choose. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Fair, fair enough. Good point. I will say this. You you brought up ultimate guitar and that type of thing. I, I would urge, especially guitar players, but you know, bass players too. And it is so easy now with the amount of resources that are on the internet to go out and do it. You're, your ear, especially if you're a semi-professional, your ear is a lose it or use it type of thing. And being able to pick songs out like we had to do when we were kids, get, you know, pick it out off the record is a really important skill. Totally. Because that skill will also save you if you get lost in a song, right? So yeah, you know if you can you hear are. the changes, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, it is very easy to get lazy and rely on internet charts, you know, and the hit record on internet charts is... Okay, you know they're not perfect. That type no, of thing. No, they're not going to be but, right all the time. But it's still a really important skill to continue to you know develop your ear, hear the changes. You know, for me, it's funny. I, I have a hard time with lyrics. Like it's really painful for me to remember lyrics if they're not cemented in there. If I have to learn a lyric, or worse yet, if I've relied on a cheat sheet or an iPad for a lyric, it's really hard to learn it once my brain knows I can cheat if I want to. Yeah. Right. But music, you know, for some reason, chord changes, you know, they, they, they stick with me. They get, if I've learned it by ear, if I've learned it by chart, it's harder. Yeah. I I'm with you on that. The more time I spend relying on the, the cheat sheet in the practice room, the much like the, the more difficult it is for me to lose that cheat sheet on stage. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. Yep. For sure. Um, Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, to your point, that like that concept of learning to hear the changes, I, I would add to that. Learn to feel, and 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 you can't feel it until you do it intentionally over and over again, and, and then you learn to feel it. But learn, do what you need to do so that you can learn to feel where in the form of a song you are too. Like not just it, you know where in the changes, but but also like are we you know, five bars into an eight bar phrase. Are we on the seventh bar of an eight bar phrase? Are we right at the turnaround? Like those things, you know it more than you think you do because you'll hear it when there's lyrics happening, right? You, you know, when that turnaround is going to come, but in the middle of like a solo or something like that, there's nothing necessarily sort of dictating where you are. You need to learn to feel that. And and to me, the way I learned to do it was just years and years of counting. You know, if I know that a soloist is playing um, X number of repetitions of an eight bar phrase, it's like, OK, well, let's count it. One, two, three, four, two, two, and, you know, seven, two, three, four, mm-hmm. eight, two, ba, ba, do, ba, ch, you know, now I've turned it around the last half of the eighth bar, turn it around, brings everybody together, hit the one big on the crash symbol and do it again, unless you know, somebody's going to step up to a mic and then it's like, all right, bring it back quieter because now somebody's going to, they're finished soloing, they're going to sing. But knowing Mm. where you are in those forms, whether whether you're a supporting musician or especially if you're the soloist, and it's harder, I know, for soloists because you're thinking about so many different things. But when you learn to just feel where you are in that form, your solos immediately begin to take on a completely new level of engagement because you will start playing through the form and actually like doing things that, that sound interesting as opposed to just lick after lick after lick. So that's on my, occasion, I my feel w- on occasion when I break a song down and I'm talking to the audience while the band is playing behind me, yeah. I have a tendency to lose the one. Sure. Yeah. And so I'll actually ask the drummer, give me the one. <laughs> right. Yep. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. You like you said, you can work it into the show. Like, just show me, show me where we are, man. I was talking yeah. to them. Well, look, let me get back with you here. Yeah, yeah, that's, yep, yeah. Good stuff, man. Yep. All right, good. It's fun. Show me the one. I like it. That's good. That's good. Cool. Wow, that's uh, we're almost at. We we passed the 45 minute mark, my friend. We did. Well, you know, it was an extra bonus section about about bathroom security that really took us over the top tonight. We didn't plan on that. No, that's right. <laughs> so you're welcome. Yeah, people. that's right, folks. This is uh, this is how we do it. All right. Well, I guess that's uh, that's going to take us out of this. We'll do another one the next time because it's what we do. Yeah. We hey, we when Grohl was in the when Grohl was in the restroom, were you were you always performing? Always performing. And you know what? <laughs> he was too. Ha, 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 ha.